interview with Chris is jam-packed with lessons and big mistakes that we need to learn from. Listen when he talks about how when he talked to Ron, one of the customers, and how he got him to select the highest paid plan, but when he talked to PBS, they just stopped returning all his phone calls. Also, wait until the end when he gets advice from a mentor that he thought was absolutely insane. He fought it for a while, but then found it extremely valuable. That and much more. Hey, Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Chris Savage. He's co-founder, CEO of Wistia. It's a video marketing application which allows you to host, track, and promote your videos. I use Wistia. It's awesome. It has a lot of cool features. It, it shows you how engaged people are with the video along the whole segment of it. It even allows you to put in, so embed, so people can enter their email in the beginning, middle, or end. So if you stay to the end, hopefully you can uh, enter your email into this. But Chris was named Business Week Top 25 Entrepreneur, 25 or under. Wistia's clients such as Cushman and Wakefield, NBC, A&E, Circus Olay, and many more. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, that's awesome. So, and a fun fact about Chris is he's notorious for trying to get phrases that catch on among friends, and one of them being, what's the latest? <laughs> the current one is you think you're so great. So use it in context. So basically, someone does something, and it's pretty good, and they're like, hey, look at this good thing I made. And it's like, oh, you think you're so great, huh? <laughs> or like someone else is like, does something, and like someone tweets something out about their business, and it's kind of shitty, and it's like, oh, man, they think they're so great. They think they're the fucking best. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to swear. It's um, okay. It's I just a, got riled up. I just got riled I like, up. I, like when you I just think, I think I'm so great, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, people often talk about how they're trying to get traction with their idea, their product, get sales. They're not sure whether to persist, cut the losses. And I find we, we learn the most valuable lessons from and how to grow and improve when we make mistakes or we you know come across these challenges. Yeah. So luckily enough to have you teach us some of your wisdom, tell us some of the mistakes you made and share that and some of the challenges. So the first thing is what, tell us um, two of the biggest mistakes you've made that allowed you to help the product in the business. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so one was very early on, we became enamored with getting like a really big name client on board. Um, that big name is HBO. And it was really fortuitous, it was exciting at the time because we had just kind of moved what became Wistia towards Wistia like a month before. And we had gotten gotten like through a talent agency, had uh, connected with HBO, and it seemed like there's this really exciting opportunity, and and you know we like flew ourselves out there on a whim out to LA. We had like no money, and just like barged our way into meetings, and like did all this stuff because we thought that's like how to be a business person and and what have you. <laughs> um, but what happened is when we were raising our first round of money, like the HBO deal was something that everything was everyone was like really excited about, and we were excited about it, and um, we had. A proposal out to those guys um, for like three quarters of a million dollars a year. Well, at a time when we were making four hundred dollars a month, so that was a really big deal. And um, it, well, it was exciting, and and it would have been a great deal to get. We actually ended up not the deal didn't work. We kind of walked away from it, and they weren't happy about it. And you know, basically, they wanted us to do things that we couldn't do. Like they wanted us to like build Wistia so that they can host it on their own servers, and we just thought, you know, if we do this, we're gonna have to move to LA, we're gonna have to manage it out there, we're gonna have to deal with all these other studios, and like that's actually not that interesting a market. Um, but the problem was we didn't really, we weren't comfortable cutting that off because we had all these investors who were putting in money and they were really excited about this HBO thing, and it seemed like it was such a big name, it would just put us on the map. Um, and so it distracted us for a long time. Um, like we built lots of custom things for them. We um, we just basically got distracted by trying to get one really big fish instead of lots of little ones. Right. And we had already gotten some like one little one, and we were on track to get more little ones. But it kind of sent us on this path that was just essentially a waste of time um, at a time when we couldn't afford to waste time. Right. I mean, again, at the time, it's a big opportunity. So. You know, no one would be like, that's a dumb move, but it's, it is distracting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just like being realistic around like, are we going to be getting tons of HBOs to sign up all the time? Like, no, we knew we weren't. We knew this was a rare thing. 
Um, and we knew that if we got lots of little guys to sign up, that would be consistent. But still, we were enamored with it and distracted by it. And um, it was definitely taught us not to get ra as wrapped up in every deal. I mean, I think it's even true now that we'll have someone something come across the transom and it's like, oh my gosh, this is this could be so huge and so different. And then it's like, okay, rein it in. Like, let's not do anything too crazy for this. Like. Every time I've tried to do something crazy before, it hasn't worked. So, you know, <laughs> let's, be, let's be reasonable. All right. <laughs> what was the second one? So, yeah, the second one. So, the first deal we ever closed with was with a company called GI Dynamics, a uh, medical device company. And when we got them excited, when they said they were going to buy, like we said, okay, we have this product that at the time was for artists, long story, but it was for artists. And we had a private way for these artists to share videos. And we never even launched it. But we went to Genonymics. What they wanted was a private way for this medical device company to share videos. And so we said, we're going to take this thing for artists, and we're going to bring it over here, and we're going to make it work for medical device professionals for you guys, which basically means we're going to make a really simple web app. And they're like, that sounds great. We'll pay you to make this. And we said, no, because we didn't want to ever go into consulting. Um, we said, what? instead, just pay us a monthly fee. And we made up a pricing grid that was like, $100 a month was the light plan, $200 a month was the medium plan, and the heavy plan was $400 a month. So slid the piece of paper over, um, and this guy, Ron, like picked it up and he looked at it, he's kind of like, we'll go with the heavy plan. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, holy shit, we did it, oh my gosh. Like, that was $400 a month, we should have asked for more. Um, because we just made it up, we didn't even have a product yet. Um, then, like two weeks later, we'd gotten to PBS. And, um, you know, we didn't have a, we had a, some network, my background's in film, that's how we were able to get there. But I only had one intro to PBS, not like I had like 30 intros. So we go over there, we walk them through the product at this point, we now have GI Dynamics paying us and using it. We're like, oh, this is a paid product, like tons of companies use it, you know, saying all those things. The PBS is like, this is really great, we can really see using this. Um, what, how much does it cost? And I had the same piece of paper sitting in my bag, and I kind of looked at Brendan, and they looked back at me and I was like, it's 2500 a month. <laughs> and they were like, hmm, you know, they kind of clammed up <laughs> and then they stopped returning our phone calls and that was it. And I, I couldn't even go back to them and get them to go for the $400 a month thing because they were just like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, we can't work with these kids. Um, and I think it was, you know, it would definitely just like taught me the value of being honest about where you're at and like I and and being comfortable with that honesty. Um, and had we just said like, hey, like this is a new product and we only have a, like one customer, this is what they're paying. Like does this does this seem fair to you? Yes, we might have left some money on the table because they could have had more control, but we could have had them as a customer, we could have learned from them mm -hmm. and that would have been great. Side note, they're actually now a customer. It just took them like four years. <laughs> so how do you figure out pricing with in the beginning or even now? It's really tough. Um, it's tough because if your price your price is too low if no one's complaining is what I found. Like you kind of always want some people to complain. Um, and if it's too high, people will stop talking to you. And fortunately for us, like we were um, we were like sitting down with everybody that we were talking to at the beginning or on the phone with every single person. Like it took us a long time before we were able to uh, like take credit cards online. And that meant that we were having some kind of discourse with everybody. So we would change our pricing constantly. We still do change it. And what, what, what I've learned is like always grandfather everybody. Right. So everyone better go sign up now if they want to be grandfathered in at the current price, right? Exactly. <laughs> sign up now. But um, like we just, we've always just grandfathered absolutely everybody. And we've, I've found that I've, I've been, you know, we can change the price here and it doesn't cause like a big hoopla in terms of like people being upset because everyone's mm -hmm. on their same thing that they've always been on. Right. And a few times that we have lowered prices, we've like automatic, you know, we've gone back and lowered it for people who were on much higher prices before that. That's great. Uh, so what's... But, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, now we're at the point where we have enough customers, enough people going through that we can see the impact that the pricing makes in a very, very different way, so it's, it's easier. But. Yeah. What's one of the big milestones? You're talking about the credit cards a little bit. What's one of the big milestones you're especially proud of after you overcame 
a big challenge in the business? So that's a great question. I mean, um, a huge milestone for me was that first time that we actually had people buying with credit cards. And it was the first time that um, I woke up and in my email was like an alert that someone had bought overnight, um, which was an amazing feeling because we got to like 40 or 50 customers or so without having credit card payments online. Um, we were doing all invoice and faxes and in person. The first credit card number we ever got was someone who came in for a meeting and they said, I want to buy this. And so we said, okay, write your credit card number down on this legal pad, which they did. Um, I, it was not my idea, by the way. This is Adam Zace who um, was like the fourth person to join us like super, super early. Um, so VP of sales at the time, um, his roles like evolved and he does board business development. But in any case, he was just like, yeah, give me your credit card number. And they he wrote it down in his legal pad and put it in the system, like through the back. And that was, that was it. So, um, but that was a huge moment to realize like this thing is big enough that like, um, that people can actually buy without talking to us and that we could get to that point. Yeah. There was a turning point you were talking about too that you were saying seemed obvious. Um, about the embedding? Yes. Um, so we didn't have any embedding at all in the product. It was all private private content um, for you know filmmakers to share unfinished videos, for medical device companies to share, to share like patient information, for stuff like that. And then we added embedding at around the same time, actually, that we started. It was the same time that we started processing credit cards, um, which lots of people have been asking for. They've been saying, we love the way that you can, we can use your product to manage our videos, but we want a way to embed this on our site too. And, we, and the analytics that we had were being used by training um, initially. And then people said, we want this on our site. And that was like, light bulb went off. You know, like when that happens, it was like night and day. Like um, just in terms of customer growth, like it, it really accelerated from that point. Well, how do you decide to actually include that? Because you've probably heard it many times before. What was the point where you're like, okay, we need to actually do this? So we, uh, like many times we've done this here where we'll, we'll have something like this, like embedding, um, not that fundamental of a thing these days, but we'll come up with a way to manually do it first. So we, people would say, if we would say, like, if you want embed code, email us, and we'll, set, we'll take the embed code and send it to you. So that's what we were doing at first. Got it. Um, which sucked because it's embarrassing to send somebody an email with an embed code when they just they know that there's the capacity to just embed a video. Um, but we it, it like forced us to feel the pain before we automated it, and so we knew that this should be a good thing. I think we just didn't know how good of a thing it would be. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to being distracted from the HBO. It's like that big thing, and so it's, you're doing things manually, so you don't get maybe too distracted to building it in the product. So it's almost like you're taking that previous experience, and even though it may be painful manually, it seems like a smart thing to do before you like launch it across the whole system. And we still we still do that all all the time now. Like we try to feel the pain on things before we automate them away, so we can actually understand what we're giving up when we automate something away, and um, we can understand a like a, and have an idea for a better solution before we before we automate. Yeah. So Chris, what's one of the best piece of advice that you would have for a founder for a company to make sure they know? I would just say that um, if you look at the history of all business, which is the history of the world essentially, uh, <laughs> most businesses were not built really quickly. Um, you know, it takes it takes a long time, and I think we see a lot of businesses that look like they're built really quickly, but actually were built over a long time. Um, you know, Angry Birds is an example that people like to give for that. Like it was like game number fifty three that the Rovio guys had made. And they were just like clearly like figuring out how to make games and figuring out um, all of the aspects of the things that they cared about that like entered into that first iteration of Angry Birds, which was also well timed and took off and everything else. But like they're still building a company, and it's not—I wouldn't say they're like a flash in the pan, you know. Like there's there's more to that. Um, and for us, you know, when we first started, I thought this was going to be like a two-year, one-year kind of thing. It'll be seven years in June, and 
Um, I love it, and it's just super fun. And I think that being able to have fun and like work with great people and being inspired by the people around you and and not compromising not compromising on your values all adds up when you're doing something for a really long time, which is one of the competitive differentiators you can have when you're not trying to have an overnight success. So, what point were you like? What year in were you like? Finally, we're getting we're getting to the point where this is where I wanted to be. I mean, you're never there, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I about about four years in, we um, it was clear that we were not going to ever go out of business, and we weren't profitable yet, but we were generating enough revenue, and we had such a commitment to our customers. Like I had so many customers that we were just talking about, like we can't fail because they actually rely on this, and there isn't another option for them, and. Whatever we have to do, if we will just go back to paying nobody salaries or whatever, like, and everyone was on board with this. It's just like it's just too important. The customers are too important, um, and and I and it, I think it was around. It was about, but it was about four years in. Up until then, we were just like clawing, clawing, clawing our way up, trying to figure out how to message things and design things and build things that actually fit together and made sense. <laughs> yeah, because now I feel like I see Wistia everywhere. I mean, like on a lot of sites. Who are those clients that you were were top of mind when at that at that point when you're like were unwilling to go out of business? We- yeah, I mean, it was like definitely Cirque du Soleil was a big one because um, they had taken a huge risk on us. They were really they did not realize how big of a risk they had taken and that they were client like number like five. Um, but they had taken a huge risk on us. They still use us. They they do like a ton of their talent management for us. So like. They're like casting for people all across the world. People are uploading videos to them and they're taking a look at fire breathers and all this stuff. And we're deeply integrated with their other systems. And it's just kind of like, man, you know, if fire this, breathers? Right. Yeah. If you have fire breathers and contortionists and, you know, all the things that you are like, you need to visually see someone on a video doing to understand like Got how it. good they are. Um, and it was them and then like just other big name brands that had taken a risk on us and, that I had sold and others had sold that I just felt like we can't fail these people. Um, yeah. And also that like we're not going to have to. You know, it was like we're not going to have to fail them. Maybe this ends up being a really small company and maybe we can't grow it, but at least these customers, we're going to treat them right. Yeah. So overnight success in seven years, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Still working for that overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, what's the most important lesson you've learned so far from running with you? That's a that's a good question. I think it's hard to uh, I think it's hard to to pick just one thing. But what I would say is that um, to run towards the scary things, and that like you have more capacity to grow than you think you do. Um, so you know, there's a lot of things I didn't think I would ever be able to do. Like I didn't think that you know we're 17 people now, which to me feels Big on one hand, it feels really small. On the other hand, we have really huge aspirations. But like, I was like, how will we manage people like this? Like, it's, how is it supposed to work? Am I supposed to have all the answers? Like, am I supposed to just say like what to do and everyone does it? And that's how it, like, and that it, you know, you just have no idea that actually, actually, it's about surrounding really yourself with really smart people that make you work harder. And like, it just feels less scary because they're so good. And like. Um, you know, like, or even giving talks. Like, I used to be terrified of public speaking. Really? Just, it's like, I'm mortified, absolutely mortified of it. Um, you never know. Like, yeah, and I was like, I'll never be able to do this. And, like, the first time I gave a talk, I was just, like, just stammering through it. And I was like, you know, people clapped, but, like, I only got, like, five or six questions at the end. Does that mean, like, I did a really bad job? Like, I don't know. And then, like, it took me a long time to realize, like, wow, that was, like, one of the best talks that I've ever given because... Like most of the time, people aren't giving, you know, aren't asking questions, and they felt like they could approach me, and like, and, you know, it's just like I had no idea. Um, and I think that it's easy to underestimate just how much you can grow doing this stuff. What was something that you remember that maybe you didn't know the answer to, and like one of the team members just just went above and beyond that that helped at that point. You're like, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure what to do in this situation. And they just kind of picked it up because that was their expertise. Is there a, a moment you can remember? I mean, it happens all the time. I, it, it's still, there, it just happens all the time that someone's like, 
Uh, hmm. We've had a couple times when there was like competitive things early on, and someone would be like poking around, or someone read an article, and I remember the first time Adam Zace, he was just like, I got this, let me just talk to these people. And I was like, we're going to talk to them? Like, I thought we were going to ignore them. I thought we were going to, like, be say something mean or we are going to be angry or whatever. And then by the end of it, they're, like, great friends. And it's like, holy shit, you know? This one thing that seems, like, terrified, you know, seemed terrifying at one point is actually really empowering. Like, there's actually a number of people who have been competitors of ours now that I've learned from Adam, you know, that um, that we became friends with them because – it's kind of like we all saw the same opportunity and we're excited about similar things and that's rare. Like it's, you know, and so like maybe we do think about things the same way and, and it's just interesting. I mean, I, I feel fortunate that I've gotten to know a lot of those people that they pushed me and um, some of them are customers now because like they've moved on from their businesses and they use Wistia and that feels really great. Um, but it wouldn't be that case if we hadn't like focused on building relationships with them and kind of taken a step back. Yeah, no, it does seem counterintuitive, but I guess everyone has their own like niche or take, even if it's like a very similar industry. Um, yeah. So, Chris, what's been one of the biggest challenges when you first started and compare it to today? I think the biggest challenge um, one of the biggest challenges is just like commun- is like how we have communication at the business today and how we communicate in such a way, how can we communicate in such a way that we're sharing information organically the way that we used to when we were really small. Right. Uh, um, lots of people, I think, caveat, would see us today and then be like, you're really small both times. Like, but, uh, it's just definitely now there's more, there's teams that focus on different parts of the business. There didn't used to be teams as much. There's like individuals. We used to all sit around one table. So if someone's on the phone with a customer and they're running into a problem, everyone else knew what was just kind of organically knew what was going on and like could take action based off of that. Um, one thing in particular, everyone used to do support um, every day. There was like no one person who's doing it. Now we have a team of three people that are dedicated to it. Um, and the support is like the lifeline of what the customers want, what the customers need. And so we do things like now we do this all hand support thing where we cycle through and um, we've tried to get it going a number of times. It's been hard. Like this is a good example. It's like it's been hard to keep it really consistent because everyone's so busy and pulled in their own directions. But it's such an important thing to get a sense of um, just what customers are running into and what problems are people are having and and where we should be growing the product. Uh, that we fight for it now. So that's like the kind of thing we never used to fight for before. And now we're like fighting, fighting, fighting to do that just so that everyone can have the same pulse of what's happening. Yeah. What's something as far as the, the videos go, how do people know what is good or not good? Cause I know you're mentioning there's a lot of people ask questions about comparing. Yeah, that's a great thing. Like that's a perfect example of something that, you know, you'd see it. And I saw that in support. Others have seen it in support where someone's like, Hey, you know, my video is getting like, people are watching 90% on average. Is that good? Is that bad? You know, is this, is that my, how am I doing? And, and then that led us to make blog posts about like pulling down data across like all the videos in the system and taking a look at like what is the average engagement based on different lengths and like how has that changed over time and some like industry stuff and the play rate, the percentage of people that click play in the video, all these different things, um, driven by like that kind of, that kind of a thing. And obviously like there's, there's more that we can do there. There's more we will do there, um, just purely based on that that customer support. So, what is one thing that we should that I should look at when I'm looking at the stats? Like, what's normal? Well, so I, I mean, honestly, the best thing you should do is I should say this: if you if you search for "Does length matter?" Wistia, um, <laughs> you will find a blog post about the lengths of videos. Okay, good. Uh, I'm glad it's safe to look at that post. Yeah, no, yeah. it's very safe. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a good example, just side note, but like, I never dreamed that we would have blog posts that were like, had titles like that, and they were just like fun and silly and ridiculous, and, but that's who we are, that's who we've always been, and like, one of the things I've learned is that you can't fight who you are, and you just gotta be willing to like, put it out there, and that's actually what people want. Right. Um, and you'll see like, a lot of the videos, if you go to our learning center, for example, like, a lot of the videos that are in there are just like, there's like, lots of silly things that have, they don't really need to be in there. 
they're in there because like it makes it fun for us. It's your personality. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and that actually, the personality can be a differentiator, which is like a crazy thing to even think about. But. So, uh, Chris, I have one final question before I ask it. I want people to know a little bit more about Wistia. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on now that's exciting and just Wistia in general? Yeah. Uh, basically, you know, we're trying to make it easier for people to use video on their website, to drive more traffic to their website, to make better content, to build their own audiences. That's what we're excited about. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we're doing. Like, we just launched this thing called Labs a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it, but... Yes. Yeah, Labs is, like, super fun for me. It's just all these advanced things. We want to make it easier to build advanced stuff on top of video. So we have, like, the Twitter Follow Lab, where you can have follow buttons come up within the video at different periods of time. So you can just, like, one-click while you're watching and follow somebody. We have mid-roll links. Um, we have, like, things that you can sync presentations to videos. Um, we have like thing this thing called dim the lights that just like dim the page on it and it's there's just lots of fun stuff in there and the thing that's exciting for me is just helping people helping people build an, an audience in a long term way that they can carry with them you know it's like we make a lot of videos to market ourselves but we also make videos and get people's email addresses and then can send them updates about different products and send them blog posts and do all this other stuff because like it's our audience at the end of the day, and I feel like that's a really powerful thing And because it's a really long-term thing. You know, um, it's almost like, should you blog on your site or should you write notes on Facebook? Well, like three years ago, the Facebook like company page looked a lot like a blog, and you could have just put all your shit there, but they've kind of changed the rules many, many, many times, and, and so you would have been screwed if you had not owned your audience at the end of the day. Right. And the thing that I see that I'm just like really amped up about it and excited about is helping people communicate better and build their own audiences. Because yeah. um, I think we're still at the beginning of a just massive shift towards people building on it, uh, like audiences that they can then monetize with products as opposed to like renting space on other people's audiences to try to get them to buy their product. Like Red Bull is a perfect example. You know, the stratosphere jump, like the most advanced, they just bought an F1, like, formula racing team. Like, they are, like, they, they, they produce an enormous amount of content all the time. They never say drink Red Bull. But yet, like, people pay to watch Red Bull content, which then has a brand impression and feeling, which is completely attached to a beverage, which is essentially a competitor to Coke. <laughs> right. But they've just changed the whole dynamics of everything such that they have the most advanced like F1 like design guys in the world working for them that they have like the highest you know free fall of all time was done by an energy drink like and the reason it was done by an energy drink is because they figured out how to turn that into content and build their own audience yeah I mean I'll tell you why I like Wistia um, it, it gives me the control too like you were saying but also it it lets me see like where people are like if I say something stupid with Chris in his interview like do people just drop off like, yeah. or do I say something or they really like a certain question and I can see their engagement. You can actually see the engagement, you know, within the video, which is kind of cool. And you can customize it. Like if I, you know, want people to come back and see other videos, you know, you could put an opt in there and not have it be like a wall. I could put it at the very end of the video and people want to see it, see it. Or if someone could put it in the middle or, or the beginning, but I just like the control that it gives me. So. I mean, it's just like your website. Like I think it's like, for me, it's just if you have control over your website and you can put your own logo in and like have the flow make sense for you and like talk about the things that are important to you, you're gonna do a lot better than if you can't. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. But I I appreciate that you like those things. I mean, I I love those things too. We use it ourselves. So, so Chris, the final question I have is. What's the best advice you've gotten? You've given some great advice to us. What's some of the best advice you've gotten from a mentor or advisor that's been most valuable? So um, one of our advisors is this guy. His name is Ashton Peary. Um, he's the CEO of a company in New Hampshire called Renesis. Have like an information data thing when there's like cyber attacks and stuff. They're the people who like track. It's a pretty cool company. But in any case, um, one of the things that he told us early on was... Um, that this is just business and like you need to be willing to take a break and step out of it to like recharge and he always used to do like 
two weeks sailing like in the Caribbean every summer and where with like no phone and nothing else and I thought that was ludicrous and I thought that was just insane um, and for a really long time I did not take a break and really long time did not take a vacation and I, I've learned that taking that step back is a lot more important than I appreciated because it's so hard to get out of the day to day and and see like what are the big problems that we should be working on what are the things that are actually working really well like what are the things that you know should we change the direction of the company or are there people that this that what we're doing like I thought it was relating to and it's not relating to them at all and like it's so much time like every time we get high level um, we learn more more things like that. So I think that's definitely something that I've learned is like it's really important to be able to take a little time off and like and take a breath and refocus and revisit things. Yeah, that's hard to do, but yeah, it's, it's good advice. Yeah. Chris, I want to thank you so much for your time and your advice and I really appreciate you coming on. My final words to you is you you think you're so great. No. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much. All right. People check out Wistia. Okay.